I always enjoy working with people, you know, when it's not their 40th movie. People are great when it's their 40th movie, but it's different when it's their first movie and they really want to score and they have so much energy and passion. You know, when you get to your 40th Harrison Ford movie, he tends not to give you that time and he shouldn't. Hey Vanity Fair, this is Judd Apatow and this is the timeline of my career. Good morning, Phil. Good morning, Brian. And how are we today? We are great. Oh, thank God the rain just stopped, eh? The first thing that I ever directed was the Larry Sanders show. I never had the courage to ask Gary to direct the Larry Sanders show. One day he just walked in my office and said, you're doing the next one, which was terrifying. The weird thing was a few weeks before that, we were doing a show about a psychic and a psychic was hanging around the office and reading different people. And she said to me, you're gonna have a flood of your house and you're gonna direct soon. And then it rained and flooded my house. And then two weeks later, Gary said, you're gonna direct the next one. I saw that psychic for years. Once that psychic told us to be careful driving in Hawaii and it scared us so much, and we went to Hawaii and never left the room. Phil, do you like my outfit? Yes. Oh, I do. Isn't it fetching? Yeah, that's, that's not the word I'm looking for. Excuse me. <clears throat> oh, man, I gotta pee. How Freaks and Geeks happened was, uh, I said to my good friend Paul Feig, do you have any ideas? And he said, let me think about it. And then one day he just handed me an envelope and it had Freaks and Geeks in it. It never works out like that. No one ever hands you a script that's great and you go, all right, I guess, I guess we'll just, we'll make that. While in production, we thought it was going well and we really loved it, but we also knew that some of the people who ran the network didn't like it. So we always felt like it was gonna end at any moment and then it did, but we shot the finale in the middle of our production because we were so, so sure that they were gonna cancel us at any moment that you know, being neurotic, we just shot it episodes before the season was over, just in case the guillotine came down. And in, and thank God that we did. What if they trash the place because they think they're drunk? They won't. I don't think. This could be bad. Support whatever decision you make. Thanks. Your support's awesome, you guys. It's just really great to have you around. So I need the rent. North Hollywood was a pilot we did in 2002, I think. It was about a bunch of people who wanted to be in show business, who were struggling, living in North Hollywood. So it was Amy Poehler and her day job was uh, working as Judge Reinhold's assistant. Jason Siegel, who played Frankenstein on the Universal Studios tour. And Kevin Hart, who had a lot of money because he was in a beer commercial that was questionable in uh, its content. We made this show probably mainly inspired by the vibe of Curb Your Enthusiasm. ABC said they wanted edgy programming and we had January Jones in it and Adam McKay was acting in it and we really had the best time making it. But in the middle of making it, we heard that ABC changed their theory about what they wanted the network to be and they wanted it to be more retro like happy days and while we were shooting we thought they're never ever going to order this and they didn't I always thought they would call and go okay we don't want to do this show but we could tell all these people are going to be stars and they never they never called they showed no interest in anybody this is really embarrassing for me but I don't have money to pay for the rent right now I was hoping you could float me for a couple of days I think I was in love once. Really? What was her name? I don't remember. That's not a good start, but, but keep going. Will Ferrell and Adam McKay wrote this script, Anchorman, and they showed it to me. And the first drafts were really hilarious and crazy. It was about the anchor team flying to an Anchorman convention the plane crashes and they wind up on the side of a mountain where they all are trying to survive and it almost becomes like the movie Alive, but with Anchorman. And we were trying to get made for years and slowly they started changing the, 
the story because nobody would make this crazy version of it. I always thought that they should still make that version, that at some point they should go back and do that. I love Lamp. I love Lamp. You really want to know what love is? Yeah. Yes, tell us. They were nice. You know, and like you grab a woman's breast and it's, and you, you feel it and it feels like a bag of sand when you're touching it. I was uh, one of the producers of Anchorman and I would watch Steve Carell on the set every day and he was always so hysterical. So one day I walked up to him and I said, do you have any ideas about you being the star of the movie? And then a few days later, he walked up to me and he said, you know, I was working on this sketch. I never really figured out at Second City about a 40 year old virgin. And then he said, you know, in the sketch, it was like a poker game and everyone's telling sex stories. And my character is clearly lying because he's never had sex. And he's saying, you know how when you touch a woman's breast, it feels like a bag of sand and you go down her pants and there's all the baby powder. And I said, I think this is something that we need to do. One of the most fun parts of making The 40 Old Virgin was we were able to just put in a lot of people that we thought, you know, were great, who weren't giant stars yet. So Jane Lynch played his boss and she was hysterical. And then we had Mindy Kaling as Paul Rudd's ex-girlfriend who he was obsessed over. And I think that was her first time in a movie, Romney Malco was someone that, you know, we loved. He did an independent movie with Paul Rudd called uh, The Chateau. And they were so funny together that we thought we should use them both in this movie. Jerry Bednob was a comedian that I used to always work with in the Valley at the LA Cabaret. And we made him one of the bosses at the stereo store. And one of my favorite scenes is when he's just talking so filthy to Steve Carell, because Steve was always so funny just reacting to people being filthy. So Seth Rogen was on the side writing up all these like dirty phrases and, and handing them to Jerry Bednam. It's not about this rusty trombone and the dirty Sanchez. Please stop. And the Cincinnati bow tie. Bush. I would do terrible, disgusting things to hook up with Jules. Unforgivable things. I hear you, man. Give my middle nut to start dating Becca. That guy's a bitch. Superbad began when I was working with Seth Rogen on Freaks and Geeks, and he, and he always talked about how him and his friend Evan Goldberg had, had been writing a script since they were 13 or 14 years old. And then after Freaks and Geeks was canceled, we were working on Undeclared together, and we did a table read uh, with the cast of Undeclared reading Superbad, and it was really hilarious, but for years, nobody had any interest in making it. And at one point, point uh, a producer joined us because we thought maybe we're not powerful enough. So we got this powerful producer to jump on the project to help us. And then suddenly he got hired to be the head of a studio. And we thought, well, now we're gonna get to make it. And the first decision he made as the head of the studio was to not make the movie that he was the producer of. We started uh, the casting process with our director, Greg Matola, and he uh, loved Michael Sarah as did uh, Seth and Evan, and we were just all in love with him. But it was really hard to figure out who was as good as Michael Sarah. Michael Sarah is the greatest in the world. And then one day we just got frustrated because we couldn't figure out who to cast. And Jonah was just hanging around on the set of Knocked Up. And we all just looked at him and went, do you want to shave really good and put yourself on tape? And, did, and then we realized he was always a shave away from playing a high school student. This whole thing is bigger than you, Fogel. So grow a pair of nuts and fucking walk in there and buy the alcohol. What if I don't feel like it anymore, Seth? What? They all fucking kill you. What? I'm pregnant. With emotion? With a baby. You're the father. How Knocked Up happened was I was sitting with Seth and Seth was pitching me some ideas for movies and they were you know, big science fiction type of ideas. And I was trying to convince him that he was so funny that he didn't need anything like that. I was trying to kill his imagination. So I said, you know, Seth, you're funny just standing there. You don't need any of that. You could just like get someone pregnant and that's enough for a movie. And then we went, wait a second. 
It was great working with Seth as the lead. I mean, I think that people uh, always work harder when it's, you know, their big, you know, lead break. So I always enjoy working with people, you know, when it's not their 40th movie. People are great when it's their 40th movie, but it's different when it's their first movie and they really want to score and they have so much energy and passion. So, you know, when we audition people to play what became Katherine Heigl's part, Seth read with every single woman who came in you know, for months. And that's part of how he developed his character was by reading with a you know, hundred different people. And, you know, when you get to your 40th Harrison Ford movie, he tends not to give you that time. And he shouldn't. Okay. okay. I couldn't take it. I can't raise this baby alone. Remember, and it gets all... You get it. So you don't understand how it works. I don't want to shop at old lady stores. I don't want to go to J. Jill and Chico's and Ann Taylor Loft. I'm not ready yet. I need two more years. That is so insane. It kind of makes sense. We were trying to figure out a way to talk about, you know, that moment when you turn 40 and you look at your life and you, you just have to assess how it's going. And we came up with this idea that they would, uh, you know, have uh, birthdays in, in a similar time frame and they would have some sort of fight and nervous breakdown, which would make everything bubble up to the surface. And, you know, we were really lucky to get a chance to work with Albert Brooks and John Lithgow on the movie. That was very, very exciting having them around. That that was the dream. I didn't even think it would be possible to, you know, to get them uh, in any of my movies. Happy birthday and go fuck yourself. Hey, see you when the Cubs win the pennant. I got to work with Maude and Iris. Uh, you know, they were a little bit older and so it was fun to, you know, find a way to show, you know, their sibling rivalry on screen and sometimes I was just setting up multiple cameras, giving them a subject and letting them actually have a fight. And then Paul and Leslie always have such hilarious chemistry as a couple. And I, I would get such a kick out of, you know, coming up with scenarios that would you know, make us laugh. And a lot of it was based on things that all our friends were talking about, we were talking about uh, at the time about you know the flashpoints of a couple you know what drives each other crazy about their behavior the most fun about making movies like this is 40 is working with leslie you know we collaborate on all the scenes and all the ideas so we do get the chance to sit with each other and you know come up with you know comedic takes on you know these different situations that have uh, driven each other crazy the funny thing about that movie is the poster is paul on an iPad, on the toilet. And at the time in 2011, the joke of, you know, an annoying husband is always sneaking away to get a break and play video games on his iPad was kind of a new joke. No one had really made that joke before about sneaking off to be on your phone. And now it's our entire lives. Hey. What are you doing? Uh, go in the bathroom. Mahala. Everybody hates you. Everybody wishes that you were dead. When we were working on Freaks and Geeks, I loved working with Jason Siegel. You know, he really made me laugh and he was so creative and smart. I kept saying to him, I don't know if you're going to get a movie that's perfect for you as the lead because you're kind of like a weird guy. I don't know if you'll match in perfectly to scripts that are laying around town. I think you probably need to write it to show people what you can do. Then one day he, he pitched me the story for, for getting Sarah Marshall. And he wasn't a big star at that moment. He was kind of between things in his career. He, he was just getting going on uh, How I Met Your Mother. And I said, you know, to get the studio to make this, the script has to be unbelievably great. And Nick Stoller, who was a writer on Undeclared, said, can I direct that and I'll, I'll help him with the script. I'll try to you know, give him notes and, and see what I can do. And the script was unbelievable. And then they let him make that movie and then they all got to hang out in Hawaii for many months. Cause Peter, you suck. Peter, you suck. Peter, your music is fucking terrible. Peter, you suck. 
calm down. I'm having a heart attack. You're having a heart attack, are you? Oh, Jesus. Why can't everything be this simple? After forgetting Sarah Marshall, Nick Solar and I, you know, we're so taken by Russell Brand, we were trying to think of something else to do with Russell. And obviously we wanted to do something else with, with Jonah Hill. Nick had this idea about having Russell play a rock star and Jonah Hill playing someone at the record company who has to deal with this out of control rock star. Our problem was that Jonah played a waiter in forgetting Sarah Marshall. So it made no sense that if we had Russell play the same character that he played in Sarah Marshall, wouldn't Jonah be the waiter? And we shot something when we shot to get him to the Greek where we reference him as having been a waiter in his past, but then we cut it out and just decided, who cares about logic? Now this is what the music industry is all about. Sergio's not crazy. I love this game! want to kill anybody else again ever yeah you that's something you pretty much you can just kind of dip your toes into you know you it's know? like we kind of dipped our toes into murder it's i killed done. like six guys I think. for years seth and evan and i were trying to get super bad made and nobody would pay for it and i was trying to think of something else that they could do uh that might be more commercial and i always had this idea about a pothead action movie because i love true romance and there was that scene with brad pitt where all the assassins come in and he's really high. And it was one of my favorite scenes. And I thought, I wish that was the whole movie. I wish you followed Brad Pitt out and he was on the run from the assassins. So I said, why, why don't you guys try to come up with a movie based on that thought? And Seth and Evan wrote this amazing script. And then we found out that that was way less commercial than Superbad. And everyone said no to that also. And only after Superbad did well, did somebody say, you guys have anything else? And we were like, well, we have this other thing that everyone rejects all the time. And that was uh, Pineapple Express. I shot someone who was already dead, so that doesn't really count as a murder. But apparently you, you hit him with your car, I'm told. That, that you killed him. Why are you telling me this, George? Because I want you to possibly do me a favor. Okay, yeah, what? Kill me. What? For a long time uh, before Funny People, I was trying to think about how to make a movie about why we like making comedy and how do we feel about it? Are we crazy? Are we egomaniacs? Are we paying some sort of price for this obsession? Is it making us jerks? And I also wanted to write about uh, observing my mom when she was sick and how when she didn't think she was going to live, she seemed happier and then when she thought the medicine was working, she got very neurotic again and caught up in life. And I would see that happen time and time again over many years. So the movie became about, you know, can we accept the wisdom that being ill provides us? And one day I realized, oh, maybe that's the same movie as the movie about why are we in comedy? What, what does it mean? I talked to Adam Sandler early in the process of writing Funny People, so he was a big part of helping me develop the idea. And it was always my dream to work with Adam. We were roommates when we were kids, when we were first starting out in stand-up. I had never gotten the chance to direct him in a movie before. And one of the great pleasures of my life was just how fun he was to work with and what a great actor he was. You know, he was always a great friend, but it was the first time I got to see up close you know, how brilliant he is in his work. I always knew that Eric Bana was funny. I had seen online these crazy sketches he used to do. He had some sort of variety show in Australia and he used to do Arnold Schwarzenegger and he had this really hysterical Tom Cruise impression that he did. So I, I was very excited to put him in a comedy because he was really getting these incredibly you know, serious parts, intense parts, but he hadn't shown his comedic side yet uh, in, in a movie, and, and he was so fun to work with. He's really funny. Mm -hmm. I don't know why his movies aren't funny though. That's weird, isn't it? And then we also laugh because we feel like we're such goofy idiots. So when like a real actor shows up who knows what he's doing, who's way better looking than all of us, it always makes us laugh. Like, look, a professional. A professional is here today working with us. 
How did this happen? Kill me, Ira. I'm begging you. Can you at least give me like a night to think about it? Ha! Ew, you had sex with him. We had a an adult sleepover. Oh, did you let him sleep over in your mouth? I was always a huge fan of Kristen Wiggs. I saw her in the first uh, episode that she was on of Saturday Night Live and she killed on the first episode she was on, which nobody does. Usually, it usually takes people a long time to get comfortable on the show. So we put her in Knocked Up and she played an executive at the E! Channel and she was so funny in these scenes with Alan Tudyk giving Katherine Heigl all this awful, insulting advice and her part didn't exist. It was all made up by her in improvisations. Then we worked together on Walk Hard. She played Dewey Cox's first wife who didn't think he was gonna make it. So we were always looking for opportunities to work with her and one day her and Annie Mumolo said they wanted to do a movie about uh, a maid of honor who can't really afford to even do all the events and the things that she needs to do for her friend and how it made her feel bad that everyone seemed to be doing better in life than her. And at the time we didn't, we didn't even think it was a, a movie that was a female driven comedy. It never even occurred to us. We just thought, oh, we're making a movie with Kristen. Uh, and then when it was done, people started saying, oh, isn't this great? A female driven comedy. And we're like, oh, I guess. I mean, that really wasn't something that was like on our minds. We just thought, let's make a movie with all these hilarious women. We didn't think it had any meaning. We didn't think it was significant. But then afterwards, I think it became important that it was such a big hit and was uh, so funny because I, I hope it opened up opportunities for other people to make movies. Oh, oh shit, you look amazing. Oh, yeah, I mean, that dress is so pretty, it makes my stomach hurt. <laughs> We're professors, Hannah. Professors. No, we can't keep bankrolling your groovy lifestyle. My groovy lifestyle? Somebody slipped me a DVD of this movie called Tiny Furniture that Lena Dunham made. And I didn't know who Lena Dunham was. I didn't even know that she was the person in the movie. I thought that she was the filmmaker of the movie. And then the, when the movie ended, it said, you know, written and directed by Lena Dunham, starring Lena Dunham. And I was like, oh my God, so that that girl did all of this and I felt a real connection to her you know she she does very personal work she you know she's so funny and open and brave and I feel like a lot of the work I did on the King of Staten Island was inspired by lessons I learned from collaborating with her because she was always so courageous about really you know bearing her soul in all of these scripts and all of these stories. Hannah look at me he never, ever texts you back. Maybe I should call him. I mean, didn't you say texting's like the lowest form of communication on the pillar of chat? Hey there, it's Aaron. Oh, uh, this is Amy. I think you butt-dialed me. No, no, I, I, I dialed you with my fingers. What's she saying? What's she saying? Shh. I was a giant fan of Amy Schumer's uh, from her stand-up, and I heard her on the Howard Stern Show talking about, you know, her family, and her relationships and I asked her if she wanted to work on a movie and at first we worked on a different movie for a while and then one day we just sat down and we started talking about relationships and Amy came up with the idea for Trainwreck and you know it was one of the great fun experiences we got to work with Colin Quinn who played her dad who's someone that I did a pilot with you know 15 years before who was the biggest star we knew when I was a kid. He was on remote control and he was he would talk to us and he was a comedian we looked up to. So it was, it was great to work with Colin Quinn. Bill Hader is somebody that has been in a, a few of our movies and it was real fun to try to have him play this leading romantic lead, which he always found funny. He thought it was a weird thing that he would be the romantic lead. I found him romantic. But before he got the part, I, uh, went to New York with Bill and had him and Amy hang out and have dinner, almost like a date. And I sat at the table and just watched them. And he said it was the most uncomfortable thing he's ever gone through. It was just me creepily deciding if they were sexy together. Did you guys make love? Yeah. Oh! My boy got intimate. Yes. Sexual intercourse. Just announce it to everybody. What do you think the employee discount is at the dollar store? 
There you are. You think it's just take it? Crashing began when Pete Holmes had a talk show and he asked if he could come do a sketch where he pitched me movie ideas. And in the sketch, he's pitching me tons of terrible ideas for movies and we're improvising. And in the improvisation, I said, but seriously, Pete, what's the idea? Do you have any ideas for like a movie or a TV show? Like, come on, what's the personal idea? Tell me the idea. And in the sketch, he said, well, I was a young comedian and I was married and uh, my wife cheated on me and then I was religious and I went to New York to try to be a comedian and I had to crash on a lot of people's couches. And in the sketch, I said, yeah, no, that's too sad. That's too sad, no one wants to see that. But then six months later, he called me and he said, I kind of really do want to do that idea I was talking about in the sketch. And that joke became the show. I thought maybe I could go on earlier, you know, while the crowd is still here. Yeah, yeah. Nah. What do you mean, nah? Please welcome the lovely Gary Shandling. Gary Shandling is over here. Here he is. Gary Shandling. Gary Shandling. Ten years. It's been ten years since you were here. Is that remarkable? It's remarkable. And, and is there a problem? The Zen Diaries of Gary Shandling began when, you know, I was helping his family go through his belongings. And he had all these incredible journals and the memorabilia from his life and these books with thousands of jokes. And when we held the memorial service for him, I cut these little five minute documentary pieces about him. And pretty quickly I realized there was a great documentary to be made uh, about our friend. And I got you know permission from his family and I called HBO and I said, I think, I think this might need to be two parts. It might need to be like the Bob Dylan documentary. And I said, you know, how come Bob Dylan's worth four, four and a half hours? Gary's worth same amount of time as Bob Dylan. And they said, well, if it works at that length, we'll, we'll do it. And, uh, and that's, that's what we did. I was excited that it got such a great reception because I really felt like there were all these ideas that Gary wanted to share with the world that were related to his spirituality, to all the work he had done to try to heal himself, to focus on loving kindness and Buddhism. And he was just beginning to understand how to find a way through art to talk to people about that. So in my mind, I always felt like this movie was hopefully what Gary was trying to express to people. As you grow, you have to find a new purpose and intention for doing what you do or you won't grow. I want to become a real tattoo artist. Your work is mad and consistent. Obama ain't right. Oh, I love your tattoos. This is my favorite. I met Pete Davidson when I was casting Trainwreck. I said to Amy Schumer, who's funny? She said, there's this kid, Pete Davidson, he's 20 years old. He's way funnier than he has any right to be at that age. So we gave him a very, very brief cameo in the movie. And Bill Hader enjoyed working with him so much that the next day he called him and said, I'm gonna recommend you to Lord Michaels for Saturday Night Live. And then he auditioned and he got Saturday Night Live. Over the next few years, we talked about one script that he worked on with his partner, Dave Cyrus. And then after a few years, we realized maybe that wasn't the one. And we slowly started talking about this idea, which became The King of Staten Island. The King of Staten Island is made up, you know, it's fiction, but we like to think of it as emotionally truthful because it, it is about a lot of what Pete went through in his life. You know, his father was a firefighter who died on 9-11 and that was something that was very, very difficult for him to deal with uh, as a kid and throughout his life. And in this movie, it's a bit of an imagining of what might have happened to Pete if he didn't find comedy. Because at about 15 years old, he started going to comedy clubs and through comedy and getting on stage and, and traveling around, uh, you know, he became a very ambitious, driven person. But in the movie, he's someone that didn't find that interest and he's just sitting around smoking pot, hanging out with his friends and he's about to get in a lot of trouble. 
In the movie, uh, his mom, played by Marissa Tomei, hasn't really dated since uh, his father died. And she starts dating a fireman. And this forces Pete's character to have to deal with all the issues and obstacles that have held him back in his life. And, you know, what we were trying to do is hopefully a really funny movie, but uh, a movie which talks about grief and how people and families get through that kind of traumatic event. Recently, I was talking to Mindy Kaling and she said, you know, I think in all your movies, somebody's stuck, like they're stuck. It's about them getting unstuck. And I never thought of that my entire career, that that's what it was. And I thought, I think she's right. I think Mindy Kaling in understands me more than I understand me. And then I felt really weird. That's it, Vanity Fair. That was a timeline of my career. I am exhausted from reliving it. <sighs> I hope your day is good. Be well, be safe. I'll, I'll be here for the next year.